It goes without saying the transatlantic relationship between the United States and Europe is unique, important. I mean, just the, if you just look at the economic uh, trade, the benefits of the economies, it's just massive. I think it's uh, something on the order of 50% of the world's GDP is tied up in our relationship. Uh, but our mutual investment is even more because it involves uh, our freedoms, our democracy, our human rights, and the rule of law. Terrorism and transnational crime threaten these values in our cherished way of life. Nations around the world, many of them represented by leaders in this room, have suffered, have experienced the scourge of terrorism. Terrorist attacks on our people and our nations, and it doesn't matter what nation or what people, are an insult and an assault on humanity. Like you, I'm very concerned about the radicalization that leads to violence and terrorism against our societies and against our values. I am particularly concerned about the travel of people to the combat zones around the world, but particularly in the Middle East, that have fought with ISIL and other groups and who may later and are, in fact, returning to home countries in the West to commit attacks against our homelands. As the situation in Syria, in Iraq, and other conflict zones change, the return of these uh, individuals to, to attack our countries, our homelands, will very much increase. The Department of Homeland Security, the organization that I am privileged to, to lead, uh, stands with you, all of you, in our shared uh, uh, efforts against these threats. In the United States and Europe, we are challenged to invest more resources in counterterrorism and border security capabilities. I'd like to highlight in particular the work of our European partners who have increased information sharing, including sharing among intelligence services, law enforcement, and border authorities. Passage and progress toward implementation of the uh, EU Passage and Name uh, Record Directive, PNR. Enhanced screening of travelers at the UN's or the EU's external borders while complying always with personal privacy rules in the establishment of the European Counterterrorism Center and the European Migrant Smuggling Center at Europol. But there's more work to be done. Throughout my career, I've been fortunate to work with a broad range of international partners tackling some of the world's most critical missions. As the Secretary of Homeland Security, I certainly look forward to continuing this work with all of our international partners to combat terrorism around the world. Aviation security, a critical component, component to our counterterrorism strategy. Aviation has been targeted for terror attacks and still is being targeted for terrorist attacks, and there are some vulnerabilities. We saw that, saw that on 9-11, and we saw that last year in the bombings at the Brussels airport. If you want to protect travel, you have to know who is traveling. Over the years and since 9-11, the United States has developed a very sophisticated vetting process to screen travelers. We collect and analyze advanced passenger information and passenger name record data on PNR. It's been very useful in identifying passengers who may pose a risk to U.S. national security and public safety. This data includes travel dates, itinerary information about tickets, baggage, and method of payment. It does not include race, religion, health information, or political orientation. Travelers retain the civil rights and civil liberties principles that we all hold dear. Collecting and analyzing this data helps us detect and prevent terrorists, serious criminals, and other high-risk individuals from traveling to my country. This practice allows us to concentrate our attention and resources in those who are most likely to do us harm while facilitating the travel of legitimate individuals. We're quite enthusiastic that our European partners are implementing the EU passenger name record uh, directive and are working on enhancing their border management in a number of ways. We at the Department of Homeland Security are happy to share our best practices and do share our best practices and technical knowledge as you all move to implement what is a life-saving program. If we're going to stop terrorists from coming into the countries, our countries, with a destructive mission, we need information about who is traveling, where they're traveling, and why they're traveling. This is the reasoning behind one of President Trump's executive orders entitled Protecting the Nation from Foreign Terrorist Entry into the United States. It was designed as a temporary pause that would allow us, in many ways, allow me, 
to see where our immigration and refugee vetting system has gaps, in gaps it has, that could be exploited. One of the pr uh, problems we all immediately, or we have immediately identified, is that we do not always have sufficient information to determine whether travelers from certain countries present a risk to the United States. This is a two-part challenge. We do not have strong counterterrorism partnerships with some countries, limiting our understanding of their security postures and potentially increasing the risk to the United States homeland. And we do not have robust information on the individuals traveling from these countries, limiting our ability to conduct a risk assessment before they travel to the United States. Two of the countries that are named in this uh, executive order are listed as state sponsors of terrorism. They don't cooperate with us. They don't have a relationship with the United States like our European allies do. Four of the countries listed, we don't even have U.S. embassies there. No one to help us in the initial vetting process. By contrast, consider the Visa Waivers of Waiver Program, which lets citizens from 38 countries, citizens of all races and religions, that can travel to the United States for business or tourism for up to 90 days without a visa. In 2015, more than 22 million tourists and travelers came to the United States under this program. That's a nearly 30 percent, that is nearly 30 percent of all the travelers that travel to the United States. We extend this visa-free privilege to citizens of countries that implement stringent security measures and proactively share information with the United States. People often say relationships are built on trust, and they are, but trust is also built on relationships. We trust our visa waiver program partners because we have relationships with them, with you. And I would like to emphasize security relationships. These relationships help us keep all of our citizens safe. DHS is prepared to support all of our partners that implement these kind of reforms that, that improve their security and their border management. This also extends to refugees and asylum seekers, fully identifying refugees through the use of biometric as well as vetting serves them as well as us. Our world is small and getting smaller. We share both dangers and successes. Nowhere does this happen faster than in cyberspace. And without going into the details of it, it is, an, is a threat that emerged seemingly suddenly and has grown beyond anyone's expectations. It's in all of our interest to cooperate against this other form of terrorism, uh, and most of us do. So I think I'll leave it with that, David, and uh, take your questions. General Kelly, I just want to ask you one uh, question before uh, moving on. Uh, the uh, immigration order that you discussed and laid out the rationale for, uh, as you and our audience know, um, encountered legal challenges. First, a federal district court in, in Washington State uh, uh, stayed its implementation, and then uh, an appeals court uh, affirmed that lower court uh, uh, judgment. And so President Trump has said that he's going to come back with a new version of this executive order that will meet s the legal questions that have been raised. I know this audience would be deeply interested in any uh, ideas you could share with us about what the new executive order uh, might uh, look like um, as it emerges next week. Yeah, I guess I'd begin by saying one of the great advantages I've had in my life is I'm not a lawyer. I just <laughs> know right and wrong. Uh, I, I take a rational uh, look at, uh, at these kind of things. It did surprise uh, the United States government that uh, the uh, courts took their action. I don't criticize it. I don't know enough about how they think. Um, but I would tell you that uh, we are contemplating, the president is contemplating uh, releasing a tighter, uh, more streamlined version of the first EO. Uh, and we will have uh, this time opportunity, I will have opportunity uh, to work a rollout plan uh, in particular to make sure that there's no one, in a sense, caught in the, in the system of moving from overseas to our airports, uh, which happened on, on the first release. So that's where we are on that, David. So people who have valid visas um, will be allowed to enter, people who have green cards uh, will be allowed to enter, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah, it's a good assumption. And, and as far as the visas go, again, if they're in motion from some distant land to the United States, when they arrive, uh, they will be allowed in. That said, uh, 
we will, we will have a, fa a short phase in period to make sure that people on the other end don't get on airplanes. But if they're on an airplane and inbound, uh, they'll be allowed to enter the country. And this, again, is just a pause until we look at uh, a number of countries, uh, seven in particular, and uh, uh, look at their vetting processes, how reliable they are, and I would tell you right now they're not very reliable, and find ways to vet in a more reliable way to satisfy us that the people that are coming to the United States are in fact coming for the right reason. 